about our prayer life and how it will determine the battles that we deal with in our lives. How many have battles in your life? Just one or two of us, right? And I believe we're in a constant battle all the time. So we need to uh, uh, to, to uh, talk about that a little bit today and hopefully give you some answers and help and some help. How's that sound? Help. We need help. How many need help today? I was thinking about uh, a time that I was uh, in the United States Marine Corps and I was going through uh, Staff NCO Advanced Course in uh, Toro, El Toro, California. Everybody in California? El Toro's uh, just north of LA and uh, was a Marine Corps base there and is now closed and all the Marines are down in uh, San Diego at what that Top Gun school place was at. Uh, anyway. <laughs> That's whatever. But when I was there, I was uh, I was up for promotion to master sergeant, and I was I had to take uh, a physical fitness test. And when you went to the school, they had you take a test at the beginning. Everybody just kind of gapped it off. They didn't really make a big deal out of it. You know, we're just gonna run our three miles. You know, take our time. We uh, we all passed, but nobody really tried. But then I found out I was up for promotion, and I thought I was a, I'm like one of those runners. Who, who likes to run here? Louis, you like to run? No. No. Uh, <laughs> I like to run. I mean, I really didn't like to run. And so I, I would run, like, I'd run real fast, and then I would be, like, walking by the time I got to the end. You know, I just, like, slowed down as I was going. And I'd get slower and slower. And everybody would pass me, you know, and I was just, well, I passed, but I would never do really, really good. So my roommate at, this, at the academy was uh, uh, from... Uh, he liked, he was a runner. I mean, he'd get up in the morning before formation, he'd go running, he'd go running for lunch, he'd go running at dinner time. I'm like, great God, this is awesome. You gave me a guy that likes to run. And so I, I asked him one day, could you help me run faster? And he goes, oh, no problem, put your shoes on. And I'm like, right then, we went running. And so we ran to the uh, three mile course, which is, you know, four, or four laps, so three miles. And so he said, just start running, and I'm gonna run behind you. I'm like, okay. And then as soon as I started slowing down, he'd run in front of me for a little while. And then he would get a little bit further ahead, you know, and I'd try to catch up with him. And I, man, I, I passed out at the end of three miles. I was running so hard and so fast because I never did it before. But at the end of the month or two months that I was there, I ran really fast. I ran, and this is interesting because for a Marine Corps physical fitness test, it was very difficult, but uh, for me, at the time, he was getting a little older, putting on a few pounds, because he's seen us great cooking. And uh, so, the, what you have to do is you have to do a 20 pull-ups. And at that time, the Marine Corps, they decided that you couldn't do like uh, kit pull-ups, so you had to actually just do dead hang pull-ups. And I did 20, so pretty cool. And, but I worked at it. And, and then after you do your pull-ups, you have to do sit-ups. And it was the old-fashioned sit-ups where you actually put your hands behind your head and you have to sit all the way up and they know what's wrong and bad for you now or whatever, it's bad for your neck and all those things. But back then we just did it, right? Because that was part of the test. And you could do eight, that was, okay, so pull-ups was 100 points. And then the sit-ups, you get 100 points too if you did 80 sit-ups in two minutes. I guess we did 80 sit-ups in two minutes. Yes, all right? So that was, I could do those, you know. A little bit harder because of you know the weight, but I got it. So then it became then it was time like all pumped up, 200 points. The maximum you get is 300 points, and I was ready to do my run. And if you did the run in 18 minutes, you could get 100 points. And I was trying to get at least a 280 or better because I was high first class. I wanted to look good on my record when I went for promotion, right? So, so I was training, ready, go, right? So I'm going over to the place where they're starting the run. And I step off the curb and I twist my ankle. Oh no! Yes. So I'm walking like you know a duck, you know, trying to, trying to get the feeling back in my foot. I couldn't do it. It was it was hard. And they're going, okay, ready? No, I'm not ready. Set, right? Go! And everybody takes off, and I took off too because I just I just the pain is no big deal, right? I'm just gonna go through this thing. I got three miles. I don't have a second chance. I got to do this thing. Nineteen minutes. I passed all the young guys, except for the real fast guys, you know, 18 minute guys. I, I passed all those guys on the way. 19 minute run. That was the last time I ran, and uh, I got promoted. 
But anyway, it was, a, it was difficult for me. It was, a, it was a challenge. I needed help. I just, it was a training. It was, I was doing, I was doing it kind of, like I was doing my running and all that stuff, but I was just kind of doing mediocre. But then it came to a point where I needed to excel and I needed help. Amen? And so, um, how many uh, look at your, we, we look at our prayer life as a, a training, but we look at our prayer life as a thermometer of where we're at with God. All right? And we need help doing that, amen? We need help understanding that. But I want to tell you today that our prayer life actually shows our humility towards God. Right? So you get Christians that have been going to church off and on, you know, helping in the church, giving in tithes and offerings, you know, cleaning in the church, whatever needs to get done. But then when you ask them what about their prayer life, it's like, well, you know, we need to kind of talk on the car on the way to church. To, to work and stuff. Like, I, that's good too, right? I'm not saying those things are bad, but there's something about just spending time with God in a closet, as Jesus said and told his disciples to do, and just speaking with him and spending time with Daddy and getting to hear his voice and knowing him. It's just a different thing. And we're, today we're going to show you that our time in that place with God, in the mountaintop, if you will, spending time with Father God, Getting to know him and hearing his voice and hearing his direction is going to determine how we deal with our challenges every day. Amen? So we're all going to go through battles. We're all going to go through trials. We're all going to go through tribulations, right? We're all going to be the sea. Come on. Did I say that out loud? I mean, Adam and Eve were deceived in the garden, right? That deception is still going on in the earth today, right? Well, is there really a God? I mean, maybe it is the Big Bang Theory. I mean, we just don't know, right? We're just kind of going through life. But there is a truth, there is a right and a wrong, I believe that. And as our faith grows in God, and as we spend time with Him, He begins to reveal Himself to us, to everybody. I met a gentleman, I, I think I said this last week, and I'm not sure if I remember, uh, from Africa, I didn't even know what country he's from, but I just love their accent, you know, so it's like I want to know him. So I, after the, this meeting with these pastors, I went and talked to him, you know. He's in Madison, he feels the same way I do about the racial divide in Madison. He wants to bring us together, and we're just talking about that for a while because that's uh, something I'm going to be getting involved in here next week with some, some, um, with some of the African pastors in town. I'm going to be going to a meeting. I just can't wait to go. I just want to just tell them I love them. I want to see, I want to see things change and the Christian community at least, so it will affect our city. Uh, we'll deal with Madison first, and we'll deal with the rest of the world later, right? So we just deal with our city, and we're part of it. And um, so he said to me, he says, this, is, this was so powerful. It wasn't even in the Bible. This is one of those statements that somebody says, and you just go, yeah, you're right. And so he goes, this, this is his, his hand motions were, this has to be shrink, and this has to be bigger. Right? Our, our mind and our thinking and our intelligence is all good. We use it for what we have to use it. But when it comes to God, we need to not use this as much as we use this. Because God reveals us to us in our soul. In our heart, He's revealed to us. Amen? And in that is where the, God, the revelation of God appears. And then we begin to get understanding. See, what we want is we want understanding and then we forget about this. So we have scholars in the Word of God. I mean, we got scholars who can teach the Bible better than I ever will. I mean, they can tell you what every ism, every ike, every thing about creation. They can tell you all these wonderful things. And I like to read their books, and I love to study their material, because it really does help me about understanding, like, biblical time stuff and what happened in creation and the flood and all those wonderful things. But when it comes to revelation of who God is, it's right here. I want my heart to be after him. Because he said, with all my heart, right? Amen. All my soul, with all my mind, everything within me, every fiber of me, I want to know who God is. And he wants to reveal that to you. So we're going to, um, today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that's going to show this. Some of you that have been in the word of God already, already know this. It's in, in Exodus chapter 17. Tim's going to come and read that. And then we're going to... Uh, we're going, to, we're going to kind of do this back and forth today. This is my lovely wife, Tina. 35 years. She's a great cook, too. And a great mom. A great wife. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
Okay, so Exodus chapter 17. And we're going to be looking at verse, starting in verse 8. Then came Amalek, descendants of Esau, and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did, as Moses said, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the hilltop. When Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and grew weary. So the other men took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Then Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua moved down and disabled Amalek and his people with the sword. And the and this part over here, you want me to. So what, what we're looking at, and, and I, I want to tie in even the story of Bob to, to learning how to run fast. Okay? He couldn't do that on his own. He had somebody that came alongside him to help him. Moses couldn't, for the battle, stand there on his own and hold up his hands. They were weak and heavy. He was tired. He needed somebody to come alongside him and help him and support him. Help him hold his hands up. Because it's evident when you look at the story that if his hands went down, the enemy prevailed. But if his hands were held high to the Lord, then is the Israel, the Israelites, Joshua, the army, prevailed over the enemy. And so we need people that come along by our side that will help us. If it's hard for you to pray, to get into that habit, bring somebody alongside of you that you know is a prayer warrior and pray together. We can't do it alone by ourselves. We need to come together and pray because there's just something about being together in prayer. And when we come together in prayer, alongside exactly Lewis, two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. When we come together in prayer for God's will to be accomplished, guess what? God's will is going to be accomplished Amen. on the earth. So let it be done in heaven as it, uh, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want God's will to be done on earth, right? So what is God's will? As a side note, I'm sorry. What is God's will? Some anybody. Is it free? This is you get a, a, a piece of cake if you can answer this question. And afterwards, there's a big cake out there. Okay, we'll start on this side. Oh, well, it's, it's, it, it, there's no wrong answers, but what is God's will? Anybody? Dion? That what? What say again? So that um, all shall seek repentance and none shall perish. Okay, just say it in, say it in your your words now instead of the Bible words. That uh, God's will is for everyone to come to all to be saved. Right, God's will, God's ultimate will. <laughs> Is that everybody comes to know Jesus and know Him and have salvation? That nobody perishes. I mean, that's God's will. So when we're praying, we're thinking. Now we th we really think selfishly. Well, should I buy a house or should I buy a boat? Right? Um, <laughs> no boat. 
uh, uh, should I work at this place or should I work at that place? Those aren't really the will of God. God just blesses those things and gives you things. I believe that with all my heart. And it's not that he wants you to live in poverty. I mean, we should be prosper, be happy, be content with what you have, right? I mean, um, you know, those type of things. God's will is that we all should uh, come to repentance. Or everybody come to repentance. So let's look at this story again and look at, um, it says that when Moses raised his hands up, as Tina explained, there was victory. Now, okay, that's, that sounds really good because beforehand you see that he said, told Joshua, go down to the valley, I'm going to go up on the hill's top, I'm going to do this, and, and as, as I raise my hands, then you're going to have victory. And he did, and it, it, it happened just like he said. And so how does that translate to you and me? I mean, that's a great story, right? And the Israelites won, they went on to conquer more people, and they were able to get the land, and they're still fighting today over the same land. So, you know, there's got to be something there, but we won't talk about that today. But, you know, he said, so there's victory. So we're talking about prayer. So what I want to put in your thinking today, if you can remember one thing oh, through this whole, whole message, is that if we are spending time with God on the mountaintop, if you're spending time in the presence of God, if you would just take a moment to seek Him, and then you're going to have victories when it comes time to go in the valley. How many of you have ever been in a valley time where just things are just not going right in your whole life, and you're just like mad about everything? Right? And you're just furious at God. You're mad at your wife. You're mad at your spouse. You're mad at your co-workers. You're mad at the driver down the, on the belt line. You're mad at the guy in the century because they, they're too slow at the checkout. You're just <laughs> mad. You ever get that way? Just me, just, okay, okay, you know what I'm saying? So, you're going to be in those times, but I'm going to tell you, mark my words, if you spend time in the presence of God, right, with your hands lifted up, and what does that mean? What does it mean when we have our hands lifted up? This is kind of cool. God, he, Moses had his hands raised. What does this, besides being arrested, what does this mean? I'm surrendering, right? I'm surrendering, thank you. I'm surrendering my will for God's will. And so it's interesting in this example that God, that Moses had his hands raised because it's like God, he's like saying, okay, I can't, we can't accomplish this. Uh, Joshua's army is very small compared to the army they fought against. And they still won because of their, their relationship with God. Amen? And the same thing with you. When you begin this, uh, I don't know how you pray. Uh, if you ever follow me around when I pray, I'm laying on the floor here. I'm laying on the floor of my office. I kneel at the, at the chairs. You know, it's not like a, a position to pray. But if the position you're in right now isn't working, you might want to change your position. <laughs> Amen? If, come on, smile. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if that isn't working for you, if, if life isn't working and things ain't working for you, you might have to change your position and get a good, different position of prayer. Amen? And surrender yourself to God and say, okay, God, your will be done, not my will. Let, let's do this thing so I can go through this valley and have victory and not be stuck in this, this, this mully rugs, right? I mean, you know, you get, to, you get to mully rugs, you get all mad about stuff, you don't, you're not happy, you just, just the way it is. And, and you just, you're not happy about nothing. But you say, well, God said, in his, when he sent his Holy Spirit, that part of the fruit of the Spirit is that we have joy. Amen. That means we should be happy. Especially if we're believers, right? Is that okay? Can we, I don't mean crazy laughing on the floor or rolling around, but maybe if that's what happens, that's good too. Right? Just some happiness. Because it is hard being a Christian, but there's a joy to know that i got a Savior that loves me and He's going to walk me through this thing, this situation, so we can have victory on the other side. You and me can have victory in this thing called life, not just going through the motions. There's a happiness in God. It, you know, I used to go, when I grew up, I was in a Catholic church, um, and my grandma was the one who took us to church, because my mom and dad worked, and then Sunday was their day off, and whatever. They weren't mean people, they just didn't go to church. But grandma did. And since we got out of the house, it was an opportunity to go to church. I mean, it was to get out of the house, you know what I'm saying? Just to get away from the house for a couple hours. Even though we sat on those hard pews, you know, and listened to the priest, and I had no clue what they were saying, but at least we're out of the house. Amen? And we didn't have children's church back then. We all sat, grandma, all us kids. I had five brothers and sisters, boom, all of us. And boy, we wouldn't say a word. Right in the back of my head. I still have like a dent right there uh, from those years. Of, it, 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 but we just loved getting out. I don't know why I'm telling you a story now. I'm lost. Um, my grandma was a nice lady too, so, but uh, 
And, we get to, and afterwards, we went to the bakery and had donuts and stuff. But, and hot ham and rolls, right? Is that something that you guys had? Uh, so, yeah, thank you. I, I've lost. That's a, that was a free story about my life <laughs> as a Catholic boy. We used to sneak the wine in the back with the priests weren't looking and stuff. At the altar boys, you know? I did too. Did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, we felt really bad, but we ran, you know, it was always right when, uh, you know, we took our robes off, we had to put all the stuff away, and then we got like sneak a little bit, and we ran out the back door before the priest would find out we took something. But I think they knew anyway, because they were drinking it too, so. Um, anyway, wow, what did they do all that for? But anyway, let's look at Ephesians uh, 6.12. And this is a battle, I had mentioned this earlier. So we're going to go through a few verses, and then Tina's going to come and share a little bit too. But let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, or inside your iPhone or iPad, you can look there too. Uh, Ephesians, chapter Galatians, right somewhere around there. Huh? Um, i got to find a person name. Ephesians. Oh, if you find it, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Lord, let's start with verse 10. Are you there? If you're there, just shake your head. Yeah. All right, you're there. Okay, good. So Ephesians chapter 6 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and be in his mighty power, and put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this, of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So we're fighting against a lot of stuff, right? We're, I mean, come on. It's what's the, I mean, the, uh, Paul wrote this book of Ephesians. He's, he's in prison. He's chained to two Roman guards, and he's penning this. This is where he penned this. And he's saying, listen, we're not fighting against these guys. We're not fighting against man. We're not fighting against the rulers. I mean, they're going to behead him in a, in a few days uh, or a little bit after this. I mean, we're not fighting. What we're fighting against is spiritual forces. To say, well, sometimes you can say to yourself, well, I don't know why I did that. I mean, I don't know what happened. And all of a sudden, it's, it's something that's, that the enemy just put in your head thinking. And, and man, all of a sudden, you're cursing somebody out and you hadn't cursed in a long time. Did you ever do that? Nobody here, I'm sure. Do you know what I'm saying? You just get, oh, how did, and you, it's coming out of your mouth. You're going, how did that happen? Now look what it says after that though. We gotta have a we have victory though. Even though we're fighting against it. It's therefore, I love therefore, so circle that in your Bible. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the days of evil come, because the evil days are coming. Alright? And they're already here. So it's not like you gotta wait for them to come. They're already here. Those powers and principalities are in the world today fighting against you and your belief and bringing doubt and fear to you. It says when those days come. And you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything that is to stand, stand firm then with your belt of truth around your, your waist, with your breast, breastplate of righteousness in place, it covers your, your, your vital organs, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So let's go back through that a little, just a little bit. I'm getting off track a little bit, but this is okay. Because we, you have to be able to stand your ground. Know what you believe in. That's what it means to stand. I'm standing. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe His blood cleansed me from my, righteous, my unrighteousness. I believe that all things become new. So my past life is over. Whatever the devil throws at me all the time saying I'm no good, I'm not going to listen to it because I'm standing on the truth. Amen. And know that truth, because the truth will set you free. Amen. And then we, I won't go through the rest of that, but you can go through that this afternoon before the football game, read the rest of the article there, or the letter. But um, the truth, we're fighting against, I'm sorry, we're fighting against those things. Now look at, uh, Second Chronicles says this. Uh, it says, if my people will humble themselves and what? What do we have to do first for prayer? Prayer shows our humility. Prayer shows that we can't do this thing called life on our own. We need help. And so when we bow our knee, 
or we lay on the floor prostrate before God, or we're standing, or whatever you do to pray, because there's no right or wrong in that. You see many examples in the Bible. But when you bow, bow your knee to God, you're saying, I can't do this, God. I need your help. Life is too difficult for me. This situation, this decision, I can't do it. And I'm telling you, if you do it a little bit more often, so when those situations come, you don't have to go in there and try and cry out to God. You know what I'm saying? You ever, you ever like, um, uh, I'm trying to use a good example here, but you know, it's like, you're going to, you haven't called your parents in like years, and then all of a sudden you want something from them, right? So you just don't go up to your mom and dad and say, hey, I need some money. You're like, hey, how's it going? How's it been? <laughs> you know, uh, oh, your car broke down. I'm so sorry. Oh, the dog, oh, you had to put the dog down. I'm so sorry. You know what I mean? You just go through life thing, right? And then finally, at the end of that conversation, you ask them for what you need. Now, I think going to God is a little bit different. If we just go to him a little more regularly, and pray and ask me, we don't have to go through that all that fake stuff that we really need, right? We just go right into the throne room, boldly with God, say, God, this is what I need. You already have a relationship with Father God, and He says, I know, son, I was just waiting for you to come to me. I know all your needs before you ask, but if you just come to me and ask, I'll help you with those situations. Amen? Come on, that's good preaching right there. Amen. Come on, God is waiting now in the prayer closet. He's waiting in the room, if you will. Bob Sorge wrote a book called Secrets in the Secret Place. If you haven't read that book, go get it. Book, download it on your your at your, your devices. Get Bob Sorge's book, Secrets in the Secret Place. If you want to challenge your prayer life a little bit, he writes in there. He says this that when you go into your prayer closet, God is already waiting for you. Well, I knew that before I read that book. But you know when he rewrote it, I was like, yeah, I get it. Because all he wants to do is humbly come to him. And when we humbly come to him, then he's ready there to say, come on, my daughter. Come on, Astrid. I want you to, I know what you need. You know, I know what you're going through. Hey, just come and talk to me. Right? Don't, don't make it like, oh, man, I remember I praying, uh, you know, last year I prayed, and then I'm going to come back to God this year and pray, you know. The first, my New Year's resolution is I'm going to pray to God a little bit more, and then next January I'm going to do it again. Don't do that. Let me encourage you, as this church, as we reach, we reevaluate the mission of Capital City Church, we're going to emphasize what God told us to do when I came here in 2005. And that's that this house will be a house of prayer. Now, the second thing he told me is that we're going to reach nations. Most of you already heard that many, many times already. But what does that mean to reach nations? Every ethnic group sitting in the sanctuary worshiping God together that is in the city, right? Why not? Because when we get to heaven, it's not going to be like all the white people over there. You know, it's not going to be like that. All the Catholics over here, all the Lutherans over here, all the Pentecostal world over here. You know, no, it's not going to be that way. We're all going to be together. We're going to be in the presence of God, and we're going to just worship Him because He's He's God. Amen. Just because He's God, and we're going to cry out with the el the twenty four elders and the angels, holy. Holy, holy is the Lamb of God. What a day that's going to be. I can't wait. I want to take some people with me, though. Hey, check this out. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Hebrews 11, 6. Let's turn to Hebrews 11, 6. I want you to see. These are just particular verses that we pulled out. Uh, I think they're pertinent for today's message. Hebrews 11, 6. This is, this is pretty powerful. This is kind of humbling verse. Verse 6. And you can read, like again, read chapter 11. This is a faith chapter. Without faith it's impossible to please God. All that kind of stuff, right? But verse 6 says, And without faith is it impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly or diligently, in the King James Bible, seek him. So when you go to God in prayer, you seek God. He says here in Hebrews that he will reward you. Now, what kind of reward would you want to get from God? I mean, what could, what could God give you? I mean, God, like, owns everything. He is everything. He knows everything. And now it says if you seek him, he wants to give you a reward. What kind of reward? Do you want a trophy that says, I have to spend time with God and put it on my mantle and say, wow, I spent an hour with God. Boom, look at that. That's pretty cool. You want him to choose? A good, good answer. 
You know? Oh, God, I need a new car. How many of you need new cars? Or how many would like to be uh, debt-free? Right? God, you know I need this much money, and I would have no debt. I have college loans, right? I got, get rid of those college loans. I'd be, I'd be, it'd be cool. Right? Yes. It'd be fine. But it's not that way, is it? What would God reward you? Think about this, Miss Tina. If God would reward you for seeking him, what would that reward be? What would you think it'd be? I'm not, I'm not trying to be super spiritual on you, but I think just, just his presence. Yeah. Being with God. God revealing himself to you like Moses did. Before he was put his arms up in the air, he sought after God. And he said, God, let me see your face. And God said, I can't let you see my face, but I'll let you see part of me. And he put his hand in front of Moses and he walked past him. Yeah, I want that. I want to be in my prayer closet and God's presence. I've done this a few times and I've even in some of our services here. God's presence just seemed to fill this place up. It's awesome. Woo! Wow, God, you are so cool. But I mean, it's really cool when you're in your prayer closet by yourself and God shows up. I'm like, wow. He wants to do that for you. I mean, he wants to reward you with knowing Him. Maybe a little bit deeper. Or, you know, maybe it's just another level of understanding of God. You know, I mean, I'm reading the Word of God and, you know, sometimes I just don't understand things. I just read it and it's like, man, what is. That's a cool parable of Jesus, but I don't, what were you saying? And I just pondered that over and over. I want to get revelation. I want to know him. I want to, you know what I want? I want to love like Jesus loved. I don't think I'm quite there yet. You know, I want to love like, I know we say this, this is good Christianese. I want to love uh, uh, compassionately or, 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 Unconditionally, yeah, that's a good word. Uncondition I want to love unconditionally, but I'm not even there, you know? I want to look at people and not judge them by the, uh, uh, Mark Luther King, by the color of their skin, but by the character. No, by who they are, how Jesus sees them. I mean, think about it. He went to a Samaritan woman, told her all about her life, and forgave her, and she changed her life immediately, and the whole village got saved. I mean, that's cool. Or the woman with the issue of blood, she had an uh, issue for years, went to every doctor, spent all her resources, and she just thought to herself, if I just go out in this, this uh, out in public, because that was a shame for a woman to be on her period and, and be in public uh, at that time, uh, they didn't do that. And so she reached out, even in that time, she could have got stoned for that and went out in public when she knew Jesus was coming and just touched his garment. Just touched it. And virtue, love flowed out of Jesus to that lady. God healed her instantly right there. Yeah. And she was a popular lady. She wasn't some, 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 uh, uh, she was a, a lady of means. God wants to reveal himself and bless you. That's why I think in America we have this, we don't have an attitude of thanksgiving. We have thanksgiving once a year, but we don't really celebrate thanksgiving as a regular basis as believers. We're so caught up in Americanism, uh, materialism, stuffism, and we forget about the gratefulness of God's presence in our life. He wants to bless you. He wants to, he says, now the word, if you look it up um, for you scholars, uh, diligently, earnestly, continuously, you put a word in there, look it up. That's how we're supposed to be with God, amen? And then we say, well, why is the church weak? Why does the church don't have power? Why don't I, why am I, why am I faith wavering in God? Because we're not seeking after him. There's a... Uh, I mean, there's probably some due diligence. We have to do something on our behalf to want God's power in our life. Or maybe we don't want power. You know, maybe we're not one of those evangelist type of people. We want to go out and win the world. Maybe that's not us. And God didn't make us that way. That's fine. Maybe all we just need to have the peace of God in our life. Amen? Maybe that's all we need. Maybe we just need genuine peace. That only comes from God above, amen? What if we just did that? God would reward you with that. 
or for us grumpy people. Maybe it rewards with some joy. So we go through life happy instead of always being mad about stuff. And the reason we're mad, can I tell you this, we talk to people that study why people are mad. The reason people are mad is because they can't control stuff. That's why we get mad. Yeah, I know, that's one of my problems. When things are out of my control, I get my natural thing is to get mad. And I have to learn not to get mad, just be, okay, that's fine. It's just not out of my control. Right, Tina shaking her head, she's like, yeah. That's him. So yeah, transparent church, let's be real for God. Amen? Let's be real. I struggle like you struggle over big issues in life. That's one of them. But God breathed more and said, Lord, give me half. No, this is what I pray. This, so you, you know my inside stuff, right? Um, this, this is in revelation of transparency for our church, right? But I want, when I'm mad, I just ask God. I, this is what I've been learning. So the Holy Spirit is in me. I shared this with you guys a few weeks ago. The Holy Spirit is me. Is in me. And if the Holy Spirit is in me, one of the characters of the Holy Spirit is joy and peace. So when I get mad, I say to myself, the Holy Spirit's in me. Holy Spirit, help me have peace right now because you're in me and I don't want me to be in me. I want you to be in me or control me in this moment. So I ask God to give me peace when I get mad. And so it's, you know, sometimes I, I recognize it and I see that God has done that for me. And I think it's really cool and I get a little happy that because he's answered my prayer. See, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be mad about things that I can't control. I just want to be happy. Happy, happy, happy. Is that what you're doing? Be happy! Hallelujah. Say some smiles. Okay, I can do some smiles. All right. Um, boy, this is taking a lot longer than I thought. So we're supposed to do this together today. But anyway, let's turn to one more verse in, in Psalm 63. I was telling uh, someone this morning, I said, if you haven't been reading your Bible in a while, and you want to get back into reading your Bible, because sometimes it's just a chore to get back into uh, reading God, go to the Psalms and just read the Psalms. Just read one or two a day in the morning or in the evening. Don't, you know, I don't want to make it a religious activity. I just want you to get back into it, into reading the Word. Because I know when you read the Word, then your, your mind begins to change to the things of God over your intelligence. Can you say, does that sound fair? Your mind begins to think like God instead of thinking like, like um, what you've been trained in. And what happens is that when you're... When you're doing your job, let's say you're a doctor, and you, you're a Christian now, and you're a believer, and, and you have all that education, you've learned, you've been through, uh, you know, whatever uh, specialties that you've learned, and now you're in a situation where you're stuck. If you're a believer and you get stuck, the revelation of God will help you overcome that situation. Amen? He always does. I, was, I remember when I was just a, I was just a mechanic by trade when I was in the service, and I remember dealing with an issue, and we could, nobody could figure it out. And, you know, we're all trying to figure out, we brought, broke open the manuals, we, you know, we had guys that had experience, we had guys that didn't have experience, we just had these guys, but, and I just remember the Holy Spirit telling me, this is the problem. So I said out loud to the guys, I said, this is the problem, we should check this. And they all looked at me and go, no, that's not it. Right? Because they weren't thinking in the spirit, they were thinking in the natural. So they didn't, they didn't get the revelation of what I got about the situation. So I'm, I was a young Christian then, so I was pretty bold. And um, I said, no, I think we should check that. And one of the guys said, yeah. So we all went together, checked it, and that was the problem. And they all looked at me like, how did you figure that out? I said, it was the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what it was, but the Holy Spirit told me this was needed to be changed, adjusted, and we adjusted it, and it worked fine. Amen? That's how God did it. So if you're a doctor, you got all education, fine. You, you're stuck. Whatever, you just see God and like, he'll give you revelations. If you're in high school or college, God will give you revelation over a situation. Let's look at um, uh, uh, Psalm 63, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, Oh God, you are my God. <laughs> Let's say that together. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land, which we're in, where there is no water. So think about that. This is a psalmist writing this psalm. God, oh God, this is actually a psalm. So David wrote this. And David was in the desert. I mean, they traveled. They know, you know that, that area, that region uh, it is desolate at times. I mean, he's like, he's writing and saying, oh God, I love this. To, can you say that? Tomorrow morning, you get up, just say that, okay? Don't, before you do anything, hit your alarm clock, shut off your iPhone, whatever you do, and just say, oh God, 
you are my God, and just see what happens the rest of your day, all right? Maybe you should do that before the football game this afternoon. No, just kidding. But just, you know, just cry out to God, and God wants to reveal himself to you. See, God is not hiding. All right? God's not hiding. And I got all levels of people here in understanding of who God is, and I just want to just say to you today, God, Abba Father, is not hiding. He's now, we have access to him through Jesus. And he wants to reveal his love to you. You want to finish this? Or do this for us? Okay. Well, it's almost 12, so I'm going, to, I'm, going to say, I'm going to close. Okay? So we'll do the second half of this next week. Because... You want to do it real quick? Come on. Come on. Okay. See my, my helpmate. Boy. <laughs> no pressure. Okay. So... Let's tie it all up. Let's look at what we're, what, what, what is the whole message? What is the reason that we're looking at this? We started in Exodus. And there Moses is, and there's a battle. The enemy comes in. And we're using this example as if we are in a battle. The enemy wants to come in and destroy us. Amen? That's, it. That's who he is. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Take everything that God has provided to us. So what's happening on the mountaintop, on the hill, will determine what's going on in the valley. We saw it in Exodus with Moses. I've seen it in my own life. I mentioned when we had our solemn assembly that I'm this, this uh, you know, Martha, but I want to be a Mary. I get caught up in all the busy things of life. I get busy down in the valley, and I forget that the power I need, what I need is on the hilltop in prayer. So I get caught up in everything that's here when I need to remember that the battle that I'm in, the battle that we're in, is one up here. There is nothing that I'm going to be able to do to change the results in the valley. Physically, there's nothing I can do. But if I humble myself, and that's a big thing. If I humble myself, if I recognize that what I what, what's going on, I can't do it on my own. If I humble myself and say, God, you are my God. And I can do nothing without you. That is what's going to change. God already knows, right? He knows what we need. He knows exactly what each one of us is going through. But if we come to him after, and this is what I end up, I end up doing, I find myself in a mess, and I come to him and I say, okay, Daddy, I have messed this up. I can't do this. I need, I need you, for you to fix this. And he says to me, I was just waiting for you. Let's do this. And then it's better. What peace and comfort we can find with knowing that if we just come to him in prayer, that he's going to accomplish it. He's going to make everything the way that it needs to be. James. In James chapter 5, verse 16, the last half of this verse says this. The earnest, and this is in the Amplified, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man. And that righteous there doesn't mean that I'm pious and I'm all holy and I got all this stuff going on, right? Righteous means what? Right? Right? relationship with God. If 
if I'm in a relationship with him, right? So the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. Dynamic in its working. If we are in a right relationship with him, we come to him. Where there's two or three gathered, we meet him in the prayer closet. There is tremendous power. And it, it, it leads you to believe that it says continued prayer. We go back to our story with Moses. Moses wasn't there for five minutes and then see you later, bye, I'm done. He was there all day long. He prevailed. He continued until he knew that God had it. That it was all over and done. And sometimes in our drive through microwave, instant mentality, we forget that we may have to spend a little time with God. If I humble myself and seek Him earnestly, fervently, diligently, He is going to meet with me. Amen? So when we're coming into a battle, let's determine now, not when we're already halfway in and dying, let's determine now that we are going to fight the battle on the hilltop. We're going to fight the, fight the battle in prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. For the third time. No, excuse me. We're going to close right now. But uh, I just want to make an announcement. The ladies are going to start meeting when? Uh, this month. This month, right? The ladies are going to meet with Tina for, for Bible study. February 22nd. Is it here? Yeah. It's a church. February 22nd, the ladies are going to get together, and Tina's going to be teaching uh, the ladies. And so please come to that. We're going to uh, see that uh, grow and uh, become dynamic. So just see her if you want to be part of that. The length of our prayers do determine the depth of our relationship with God. Okay? The length of our prayer does determine the depth of our relationship with God. So you can sit down for two minutes and spend time with God, or you spend a little more time. And in that intimacy with God, He begins to reveal Himself, us and re, re, uh, reveal himself to us in a much deeper way so for understanding. So I just want to pray a prayer over you right now, if you don't mind. I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to leave here. But I want you to feel like you leave here today saying, yes, I want to go spend more time with God. I want to know Him. I want, us, I want Him to reveal Himself to Him, to, to be like He did for Moses. Amen? I want Him to do that. So let me pray this over you right now, and we'll close. Father, thank You. Thank You. Thank You for sending Your Son, Jesus, to shed His blood and sacrifice His life for mine that I'd be forgiven of every sin, every guilt, every situation. So for that, Father God, I'm so grateful. I pray, God, as we, as a church congregation, uh, seek you together, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us more and more. And Father, as we as a leadership team have vowed that we would spend more time on Wednesday praying, these monthly meetings and these quarterly meetings, God, I pray that we would do that not to gain a status or say, look what we've done. But God, that you would reveal yourself to us and that we walk in your power. And Father, I thank you for that. Bless your children today and we'll give you glory and praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Take a moment and greet one another. And I love you guys. It's a good lesson. It's hard, but it's good. Amen. Next week is going to be on prayer again. Amen. And I think we're going to end up uh, our prayer series teaching on the tabernacle prayer one more time for you that haven't been through that 
Uh, we'll probably only have to do it two Sundays. But we want you to just, it's just a, a way, a model of prayer, uh, a way of just spending more time in prayer instead of rushing through uh, just what we need. Amen? God bless you. I love you all.